Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. I know it's been a little while since my last video, but unfortunately I've been busy with my day job and lots of travel and stuff, so I haven't had a moment to make a video. But tonight I wanted to talk about, you guessed it, the PC Junior. We're gonna call this part three of my PC Junior video series. So in part two where we left off, the PC Junior was mostly working, but it had that really annoying problem with the floppy controller where it wouldn't work when I power cycled the machine. So tonight we're gonna to take a look at that and I'm gonna show you a couple of the quick things that have happened to this computer since the last video. The first thing I wanna focus on is the keyboard. Now if you remember the keyboard from my last video, I was missing something and it was the IBM badge. Well you notice here I have the badge. Remember I had the bleeding on the die sub letters. I think people posted in the comments and told me that these letters were printed on, not double shot keys like on the Model M. So the letters sort of bled with a reddish color around them. Well, this keyboard now no longer has any of that. So how did I go from that keyboard to this? Well, this is still the same keyboard, but I was down in Los Angeles visiting my friend Dave Just Dave, and he had a PC Junior, but he had a keyboard that wasn't working. So I had brought mine down there to test his PC Junior just to rule out the fact that it wasn't his IR receiver that was bad, and it was actually his keyboard. So when we did, we found that my keyboard worked fine with his computer, but his keyboard still wasn't working. So in the end, since his keyboard was bad, he did a really nice thing and he just gave me the top cover from his broken keyboard. So a huge thumbs up to Dave Just Dave. I really appreciate the keyboard cover. Thanks very much. So you might have already noticed my next mod. Right here, there was a sticker that says reset. And if I reach my finger inside the cartridge slot, there's now a button. And if I push it, the computer reboots. I'll crack the computer and we'll take a look at how I wire this up inside. As a side note, you may have noticed my IBM logo here and you're wondering how I got to this while I'm at the DOS prompt. Well, I actually used the DOS program, The Draw, to recreate this logo based on a picture I had of the original boot screen. So check the description on the video where I'll put a link to this if you feel like downloading this file for yourself. Before we get to looking inside the computer, I wanted to point out that this computer absolutely still has the problem that when I power cycle it, it doesn't boot most of the time. And let's demonstrate. And yep, by now it would have done a floppy drive seek. It's just hanging up here. It's gonna give me the error H, if I recall. Error H. All right, so inside the PC Junior, let's first take a look at the reset circuit. So here we have the PC Junior with the disk drive removed. And there's a couple interesting things. First of all, this is the CPU, which yes, I did stick a couple of heat sinks onto. Probably not necessary, but I did it. So the reset capability on this particular computer is handled by this Intel chip right here. And there's a line on here that if you ground, it resets the entire computer. And what happens on the PC Junior is the cartridge slots actually have a reset functionality to them. And when you insert or remove a cartridge into each slot, it shorts these two pins together that I have these wires coming off of, which actually reboots the computer. So you can plug and unplug a cartridge for the PC Junior while it's powered up, and I think that's safe. Now, I don't have any cartridges, so I haven't tested this, but people can comment below if you know the truth about this. But I know this reset functionality is here on both of these cartridge slots. So to create the reset button, all I had to do is solder two wires onto these two pins, essentially the top leftmost two pins, and I can't really show it to you very easily, but I drilled a hole in the side of this cartridge slot and I installed a momentary top push button. So looking inside the cartridge slot, there it is. A little button right there. And because the hole is on the side, if I did take this switch out, if I wanted to restore this computer back to being able to use the cartridge, I could do that easily. And I don't think anyone would even notice that there's a little hole there. So the next problem is the floppy controller cart. You'll see this wire coming off the controller chip here and probably wonder what the hell is going on. But what I did is I actually installed another switch on the front of the computer. Right inside the other cartridge slot, there's now a toggle switch. Now you may ask, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> so once I installed the reset switch in this computer, I was able to do further testing on the controller card to determine where the problem was. I wanted to isolate if it was something on the motherboard or something on the controller card that was causing this boot problem. The controller chip here is connected directly to a reset line that goes into the logic board. And pushing the reset button on the front of the computer resets not only the CPU, but also resets the floppy controller card. 
and I found that resetting the computer did not fix the booting problem. That kind of told me that the problem might be on the controller card. So I had another idea. And let me tell you that when I tell you guys what I did for testing, people are going to think I'm crazy. But this helped me analyze the situation. So I found that when the computer was assembled and powered up, if I unplugged the floppy controller card and put it back into the slot, and this is while the machine was booted up, and then I pushed the reset button on the front of the computer, the computer would actually boot properly. So without fail, if the computer wasn't working, while it was sitting there with the error on the boot screen, I just popped the card out, put it back in, pushed the reset button, and it would work. So that led me to believe that something on this board was malfunctioning and resetting its power was making it work again. So the most likely candidate for me was the floppy controller itself. So what I did is I checked the data sheet to find out which pin was power, and it's this top one right here. This is the five volt input, and I snipped the leg. But for further testing, I wired this toggle switch between a five volt feed, which is the side of this capacitor, and the leg that goes right into the chip. And with the chip powered up, and the board installed in the computer, the computer booted, but then I power cycled it and it would stop working. I toggle that switch on and off, hit the reset button, and the computer would work again. Without fail, it would be booted and working perfectly. Now as a side note, there are two electrolytic capacitors on this board. Well, two original ones. You'll see I added a third one here. There were a lot of people in the comments who told me that it was probably the capacitors on the board that were causing an issue. I personally don't subscribe to just replacing capacitors to fix problems, especially when they're not leaking and especially on stuff from the early 80s. Those capacitors, especially ones that are Nichicon like these, are really well made and if they're not leaking, they're probably working perfectly. But just to satisfy people's curiosity, I clipped the leads on one side of both of these, I clipped my ESR meter onto these, and both of them not only had excellent capacitance at exactly their rating, or actually a little higher if I recall, but really low ESR. But at this point, I fully believe that the chip here is the issue with this board. So what I've gone ahead and done is I've ordered a couple new chips, and I have a 40 pin dip socket, which I'm gonna install into this board, and we're gonna test to see if a new chip in this controller board solves my booting issue. So first off, I'm gonna remove this chip, which is a 765AC, and I'm gonna replace it with these two, which are 765BCs. And checking out the date code here, these are from 1991, and this chip is from 1983. So it's quite a bit newer. Hopefully, these just work better. So what I like to do when I remove a chip like this that I feel is already bad, is I'm gonna cut every single leg off the top of the chip here, and that will just leave the pins, which will be very easy to desolder, and then I suck the solder out of each of the holes, I can install the dip socket and put the new chip in. All right, so the chip is out. Sorry, the camera stopped recording while I was doing it, but I got it out. Now to install the socket. There's a little bit of a pain. I should have just removed this capacitor, but I just left it there. So time to put the socket in. Okay, socket is fully installed, and it's looking good. If you notice, that capacitor is no longer there, and that's because I moved it to the back side. The problem was with the socket, it's a higher profile, and it was tucked in there 
very tightly and there just was no longer room for the existing leads. So I just swapped it around to the backside. So let's put one of these chips in here and see if this works. Fingers are crossed that these are good. I don't, haven't been able to test these, so hopefully they work. Okay, everything's reinstalled for testing. We're gonna try this out for the first time. I haven't turned this on yet. Let's see what happens when I turn on the power. Yeah, so clearly it booted up. Let's let it sit a few minutes. I'll power cycle it, see if the problem comes back. Well, the computer's been on for about 10 minutes and I've power cycled it several times and everything still seems to work. This seems to have fixed my problem. So let me button up this computer. I'm gonna remove this toggle switch and maybe this is gonna be good to go. Well, there you have it. This PC Junior was a little bit of a basket case when I got it. Now it's working really well. First we replaced the IR receiver thanks to a viewer. Then I got the new keyboard cover so the keyboard has the right logo thanks to Dave Just Dave. We peeled the tape off this badge right here to, to show the nice monitor badge. We also peeled the sticker off this disk drive that shows the IBM badge. Swap this disk. We did the reset mod, and that made this thing work better. Of course, we changed the disk drive controller chip on the controller card, which fixed that random horrible boot problem. And all that's really left is to get a sidecar for this thing so that I can actually use it for some more stuff than I can with the 128K. So I think I have one of those coming. And that'll be for the next part to see if this computer can really be made to be a little more useful. Anyways, if you found any of this interesting I'd appreciate a thumbs up otherwise if you didn't feel free to give me a thumbs down and put your comments and questions in the comment section below thanks for watching bye